Hey everyone, my name is Christopher Paolini, and I'm the author of Aragon and the other novels in the Inheritance Cycle. Last year I had a new book come out, which is To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, an epic science fiction novel full of spaceships, lasers, aliens, explosions, and of course, tentacles. Can't have the science fiction without tentacles. I was incredibly excited to be asked to give this talk by the National Air and Space Museum, partly because I'm a huge fan of the museum itself, and also, also because I'm a huge fan of space, space exploration, and science in general. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, I use science in my writing, how you can use science in your writing, and why you should use science in your writing. And with, by writing, I of course mean everything that's involved, you know, whether that's world building, characters, story, every element of the process. So let's start with the question of why. Why should you uh, use science or try to use science or incorporate science into your fiction? You know, you might think, hey, you know, I'm writing a story, it's all made up, I can do whatever I want. And you know what? You're right. You can do whatever you want and it is all made up. But you need to be internally consistent. You need to be true to the universe and the world that we know if you are referring to it and if you're referring to elements that are familiar to us. People are willing to forgive you, um, you know, large things. They're willing to accept spaceships that travel faster than light. They're willing to accept the existence of dragons. But if you get the small things wrong, uh, that will break the suspension of disbelief and cause problems for your reader's enjoyment of the book. So that's one reason to pay attention to the science and to make sure you understand how things work. Another reason is that, well, you know, fiction inspires people. And by thinking about, you know, how science may evolve and what the implications of it and where it's going, you may write something that could be actually very influential. You know, I, as a personal story, I was introduced to science fiction through Star Trek, through the series Next Generation, and it, just really inspired me to go out and read and watch a lot more science fiction. And that's true of a lot of people. There are a lot of NASA scientists and astronauts and other people in the sciences as well who got into that because of Star Trek. In fact, there's a, uh, and I'm not, this isn't solely about Star Trek because there are other science fiction stories that have had this influence also. But as for Star Trek, um, there's also uh, sort of an apocryphal story, but I believe it's true that uh, there were a number of engineers who were actually inspired by the old school communicators in original series Star Trek that the communicators they flipped open and so the engineers looked at that and said you know boy those are cool I wish we had those in real life and that directly inspired the development of the original cell phones which flipped open like the communicators so that's one of the ways that fiction can influence the real world you know people can look at stories and say, you know, what if that actually existed? What if we tried that? What if we built built that and, and went out into the universe? Uh, I mean, heck, there are people on YouTube who are trying to make lightsabers, so they may never succeed, but what if they do? The reverse is also true. You know, discoveries that we make uh, in the sciences inform the stories that we write oftentimes and can inspire new types of stories. So it goes both ways and it's incredibly an incredibly important conversation between science and fiction and vice versa. Um, and I, I also believe that it's incredibly important that humans someday move off Earth and out into the universe. In fact, I think that's our destiny to spread out among the stars someday. I hope uh, if, you know, if I have children that, or they have children, that that's an opportunity that they'll have. I don't think it's something I'll get to do myself, uh, but that's why I write about it, so I can experience it in some way. So, and, and that's also why I like, why I chose to write science fiction, because I believe so much in that uh, hopeful future of humanity that I, I felt that writing a story about it was something useful and worthwhile to do with my life, and maybe it'll inspire some others. So anyway, that's a bit of the why you can use science fiction, why you should use sci science and how it can help you. Let's talk about how. How do you go about actually doing that? Well. There are a number of ways. The, the, the broad answer is just to read as widely as you can. Learn as much as you can. Don't treat it like you're at school. Don't feel like you're having to sign, you're gonna have to perform on a test because you're not. But read everything you can because you never know how you're, when you're gonna pick up some interesting bit of information. As an example, I have a book here that uh, I read years and years ago. It's called The Ancient Engineers by Le Sprague, Sprague de Camp. I'm probably butchering his name, apologies. 
But uh, very interesting book. And I learned in there that when the Romans didn't have the concrete they wanted to uh, sort of set the paving stones in their roads, that they would use lead. So they would hammer thin strips of lead in around the paving stones, and you would have these whole roads with these silvery veins between the stones. I thought that was so cool. I put it in my uh, last, in the last inheritance novel, if, uh, just because I thought it was cool. And there are lots and lots of things in my writing that have uh, ended up there because of some a uh, random piece of information that I've read. But science can be even more useful than that. Uh, again, when writing fantasy, you might think, hey, it's magic, it's dragons, what does science have to do, do with this? Well, at one point, I needed to know how much energy it would take to boil someone's brains with a magical spell. And you know what? In order to figure that out, took some math. I pulled out my high school physics textbook and figured out how much energy it would take to boil uh, you know, a certain amount of cubic inches of water, since brains are mostly water. And as it turns out, you can boil brains pretty much all day long, as long as you keep eating pretty regularly. But please don't go boil someone's brains. Uh, of course, when it came to writing science fiction, I needed to put a lot more attention into the science part of that. And the way I did that was, again, by reading widely, but then also figuring out what I didn't know and then specifically researching that. So I found a really great website called AtomicRockets.com, which has tons of resources for writers. It's specifically aimed for writers who want to understand future technology, even near future technology like rail guns and things like that, spaceships, computers, space stations, and how all of this could possibly work. So I gorged myself on that website and I learned everything I could, but I also found some problems. Now here's the thing with world building. You're going to have a certain story in mind. You want to tell that story, but <laughs> that story may not always be possible in the way you want it to be. You know, so as you are creating your universe or your world, you may come across certain questions, certain thoughts that, that interfere with your story. And your first reaction is going to be to hand wave it and gloss over that problem and say, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. We're just going to ignore that and tell the story I want to tell. And that's a perfectly reasonable reaction. You know, that might be what you should do. The problem with it is that if every writer does, uh, ignores that problem in their work, you end up with very similar solutions to the same problems. And that can lead to a certain sameness of ideas and of fiction. So my recommendation would be when you find something that does sort of stick in your mind a little bit, a little bit of friction, is you dig down into it. You ask questions and you try to figure out what would actually happen if this were true and if this were real and what the implications would be. In my case, for To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, that friction for me was how my characters could travel from one star system to another faster than light. And specifically the problem with it is that, according to physics as we know it, if you travel faster than light, you automatically have a time machine. And personally, I didn't want my spaceships to also be time machines. Now again, my first reaction was to hand wave it, wave it and say, well, you know, the spaceships just don't travel through time and that's that. But I wasn't happy with that answer. So I set myself a challenge. And that challenge was to find a means of faster than light travel that didn't contradict physics as we know it, that hadn't been used by some other science fiction franchise, and that didn't allow for time travel. And you know what? That was hard. That took me an entire year of research. Now, when you're doing research, you need to, you know, figure out what you don't know. And the best way to do that, quite honestly, is to find some experts. Find some scientists, find some people who know what they're talking about. The cool thing about experts is they usually love talking about whatever their uh, field of expertise is. They've devoted their life to this topic. They're usually happy to share, especially when it comes to making sure that someone's book is going to have the correct information in it. In my case, I did a bunch of reading and I found ended up finding a rocket engineer uh, by the name of Greg Mahalik. Uh, he's actually working on developing a, a theoretical fusion drive at the moment. But he and some other uh, of his acquaintances, uh, they dabble in theoretical physics and they have come up with a theory. I'm not going to call it a theory of everything, but it's pretty close to a theory of everything. And it answered a lot of my questions and allowed for the technology I needed for faster than light travel. So I emailed Greg and I said, you know, hey, I'm working on this book. Um, 
I could use some help. And he was kind enough to hold my hand and walk me through the theory and answer all the questions I had. And boy, I had a lot of questions. So don't be afraid to reach out to experts. It's very easy to learn about 80% of any one subject. Um, I, I actually heard this from another author, Brandon Sanderson, and I happen to agree with it. It's very easy to learn about 80% of whatever the topic is. That last 20%, though, is what you're going to spend years on. That's, that's where mastery comes about. So as a writer, don't try to master every subject, but do try to grasp like that first 80% and then reach out to the experts for help, whether it's you know a doctor to advise on how your medical scenes might go in a story or a physicist to advise on you know how your spaceships might work in space, that sort of thing. And I guarantee that your book your story, your character, your world will be far better because of it. Science is the process of asking and then answering questions. And so is the process of world building. So is the process of storytelling. Humans are storytelling animals. We, I, I'm telling you a story right now. We convey information in stories. You know, saying A, you know, if I add this chemical to this chemical, it causes this reaction. That's a story. So. You create your world, you create your characters, and you create your story by asking and then answering questions as honestly as you can. And that is my absolute best advice for when it comes to world building, science, and storytelling. Anyway, I hope this was of some help. Go forth, be awesome, and I hope to read your stories someday.